The Democratic Republic of Congo is the third richest country on earth, ripe with diamonds and gold. Its forest filled with rare and valuable timber. Its fertile land could easily feed all of Africa. But Congo has known no peace since 1960. Its riches have led to decades of corruption and the world's deadliest war. More than four million civilians have been killed since 1998. 1,200 people die every day from disease, hunger, and violence. The first democratic elections since 1960 are part of an agreement to end a bloody civil war. 35-year-old President Joseph Kabila heads a volatile transitional government while ballots are being counted. 17,000 UN peacekeepers thinly stretched across this massive country try to maintain the peace. But the killing continues. This is the story of nine days in May of 2006 that may ultimately help change the Democratic Republic of Congo forever. Nearly 7,000 miles and two decades removed from his native land, Dr. Oscar Kashala, a Harvard-educated cancer researcher, decides to leave behind his comfortable life in Boston to launch a risky Congolese presidential bid. That desire led him to consultant Frank Amadeo. Uh, he was referred to Orlando to meet with uh, tactical intelligence about providing personal security for him in the country. I met him and we talked for an hour mostly about making the kids healthy. And he would, told me stories that were just horrendous about the children in that country. I got to know him pretty well and I began to realize that he needed somebody to help, I made an offer. He, he decided to take it, that I would be able to coordinate the strategy, all the aspects of the campaign, and that I had the resources to do so. After talking with Dr. Kashala, I think all of us were, were sold on the fact that, that he had a vision for the country, and uh, uh, we believe that, uh, that he's uniquely qualified to, to lead that country. Kashala is absolutely a person who I think is the best chance for hope for the people of that country in the future. Joe Robinson, a political consultant and former SWAT team captain, and Kevin Billings, a retired Secret Service agent in charge of protecting two presidents, would lead a small ACME team to the DRC to plan strategy and coordinate security for Dr. Kashala. An advanced team from sister company Tactical Intelligence International spent weeks in the DRC preparing for their arrival. There was all the logistics planning which is, you know, really a primary issue when you're bringing people over is how are these people going to, you know, how are they going to live every day? How are they going to operate every day? Um, what's the base of operations going to be? Robinson, Billings, and their families knew they were headed into one of the world's most volatile countries. I didn't like it, um, but then again, that's kind of what he does, and that's what his expertise is, and I know that if anybody can go somewhere and be safe and it's him. There's a rule when you travel internationally, especially you never wear anything around your wrist or around your neck that's worth more than your hand or your head. So following that premise, I stripped out a lot of stuff. After arriving in the DRC, the ACME team went about their business, perhaps too well. But within a couple of days, we had made meetings and contacts at the highest strata of uh, political parties and business people. I think that uh, is, is what got us into troubles. We met with too many people in a short period of time, and I think that's what uh, might have uh, made the, uh, the uh, current administration a little, little leery of us and, and worried that, uh, that we were accomplishing too much. On Thursday, May 18th, Robinson and Billings had completed a very successful trip and were ready to return home. He called me and said, hey, we're boarding the plane. Um, I'll give you a call when we get to Paris. And he walked up to the clipboard and called our names, and my stomach flipped over. I mean, I'd been in situations in other parts of the world. I knew it just it wasn't a normal call out. And he said, we, need, we have somebody who needs to speak to you. Uh, if you can please step off the plane. And then they took us off the plane. 
And while I was looking at our passports, I noticed that our luggage had been taken off the plane. It was now sitting on the tarmac, which is not a good sign. And then at each step along the way, they pulled the stairs and the plane pushed back. The gentleman from the National Police that was with us uh, was on the phone and uh, uh, screaming on the phone, no, we've got to hold the plane. We need to hold the plane until these gentlemen get back on. And, and we finally got through that river of denial and saw that big bird fly away. Turns out, in the end, it, it was all an elaborate ruse. And then their, their shtick was that it had been a misunderstanding that we should come to the airport the next day and recover our passports. So we boarded our car, and we're heading back to our house. Uh, and at that point, we contacted the, uh, the U.S. Embassy. And I asked her if we could come stay at the embassy that night. And she said, but they, it's not a problem they'll have your passports for you by morning and it's really not necessary for you to come to the, to the embassy and, and stay at the embassy, uh, everything's fine. So they returned to their house and went to bed but were awakened in the middle of the night. Uh, we were asleep. We had uh, uh, four Nigerians that, for lack of a better term, were our security for, perimeter security for the house, just, they were nothing more, they unarmed. 5.36, I looked at my watch. One of the Nigerians came in to SAF and said that there are people inside the wall. Uh, we got up and got dressed because figured that if they're coming over the walls, they're, they're going to want to come in the house. And in the next couple of minutes, people came into our room. We were getting dressed as quick as we could with AK-47s. We were hustled outside, put on a step. And it, it's a walled house. There were people with RPG rocket launchers, AK-47s, a lot of anger. All of the SWAT members at one point in time started yelling at us and they all got in a big semicircle around us and you could see them clicking their uh, AK-47s off of safe and on, onto uh, either single action or full auto, full auto and they were screaming at us in a semicircle and they all had these weapons pointed at us. They could have made up any story they wanted to make about what they did to us and why. There was a lot of anger and fear in their eyes. And could easily tell everybody, well, you know, we, we attacked them or we were trying to escape or something like that. No one would know any different. A police officer and two soldiers actually at one point grabbed up Eduardo, one of the South African translators we had, pulled him forward and beat him with the butts of their AK-47s. At that point, uh, uh, Joe and I stepped up and said, whoa, 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 you know, stop, stop. There's no reason for this. And had we not screamed and called out, a, it was a plainclothes captain who was inside they call it searching, I call it looting our house. He came out and screamed, pa brutalité, you know, no brutality, stopped it. Or Eduardo would have died. At that point, we were each taken back into the house at gunpoint by one of the military police there, the police officers, and robbed of all of our money. Puts a gun to my head and reaches in one pocket and pulls out $500 I had in one pocket, and then reaches in the other pocket and pulls out a 150 euro I had in the other. And with a gun to the side of my head, he says, uh, he says, I keep this, I keep this. What do you think, what do you think? And I started laughing. I said, I think you're a thief, but you've got a gun to my head, so yeah, you can have it. And then we were crammed into our own vehicle, and the convoy took us to the building where we ended up being captive for the entire night. Even at that point, we still didn't know where they were taking us, and they could have easily taken us someplace outside the area where they could have done whatever they wanted. Back in Orlando, one missed phone call was reason for concern and action. When we didn't hear from them in the morning, we realized that, that something had gone awry. We couldn't get a hold of anybody on the ground. That was at 6 o'clock in the morning. We had started this scramble of calls, and about 10 o'clock, I notified Frank. And I said, we've lost communications with our guys. Uh, we had crossed our fingers that the reason we didn't hear from them is it was a mad rush to the plane in the morning like they had been promised, and there was no phones from which they could call. When the plane landed in uh, Paris and they didn't call, then we knew we had a problem. And um, I started just kind of getting the wrong feeling about it. So I, I actually reached out to the company and they said, yeah, we've, we've lost um, uh, our communication with them at this point right now. About 12 o'clock then we had started moving in here and turned it into a, uh, a full-blown you know, recovery force. We set up a uh, what we call the, the situation room, where we had uh, oh, 20, 25, sometimes 30 people uh, around the big conference table, all with laptops. We had uh, phones going, just you know, blazing. And we began to search for people who knew people 
uh, that were friendly to the president of the country so that he could convey to them that our people were missing. I would work most directly with uh, President Bongo of Gabon and with, um, with uh, Abu Mbeki of South Africa and with and Africa is known for leaders who, who torture people and who kill people and um, we weren't sure if that was the road that these guys were put on. And, you know, we were joking months ago about, yeah, one of these days when you don't get a call I might be at the bottom of the Congolese River and suddenly that wasn't funny anymore. So I think for the next probably 24 hours was the worst of it because we didn't know where he was. The biggest concern I had was that Whoever had them in their possession knew that we were aware they were in their possession so that no accidents occurred. So we, you know, we lit up the world. Back in Kinshasa, Robinson and Billings were also trying to establish contact with anyone who could help. That was probably the hardest. Um, the uh, <laughs> first day. Uh, my daughter had a birthday party and I wanted to be home for that and I was so worried that they weren't going to have it because I wasn't there and that they would be too worried and I had no way of telling them I'm okay I'm okay go ahead so that was the hardest yeah the first first day we were arrested and, and uh, knowing that my, my wife didn't have any idea where I was or who had me. Uh, my biggest concern was this goofy birthday party. Well, you never worry about yourself as much as you care about the impact of the people, especially families. So you really, I concentrated a lot on pushing thoughts of family and the impact on family away and thinking about the good times, traveling with my wife, watching my kids grow up. At this early stage in time, we suspected they may have been grabbed by a militia group. That word quickly spread through the ACME networks. They really, really had a genuine concern. They were worried. Matter of fact, they were worried sick. I never doubted for a second, Mark, that there weren't a lot of people pulling for us at a lot of different levels. We had a system in place where I knew that they knew that we had been captive. Mr. Amadeo had told us from the very beginning that, that he would take care of everyone's families if anything happened to anybody. Uh, and, and I always believe that. And so, you know, all these things go through your mind, and, and I'd never been in a situation where I just didn't know where he was. Um, so that was the hardest part. Finally, on day two, a break. One of ACME's operatives on the ground had located the captives. We, we think we know where they're being held. Because some of the people we had in country were able to, you know, reach that police department, the military police headquarters, and said that two Americans and some South Africans were present. And we finally got confirmation that they had been put in one of the government um, prisons, Kinmarzir prison. You know, you would think you'd go, oh my God, but we were so happy to know that they knew where they were and that they were alive and that they were someplace that we could, you know, someplace tangible that we could, you know, get to, that um, we were all excited. Uh, once we found out where they were, then we began, we kind of sent a message to the country that we were a little different than everybody expected because we were able to apply pressure from lots of directions. Uh, the European Union, uh, Interpol, uh, the State Department. The Red Cross, the UN, um, uh, different ambassadors uh, to different foreign nations. The Situation Room became an around-the-clock operations center. The reason I'm calling, they were returned to Ken Mazier. He's almost 100% sure they're at the Ken Mazier facility as opposed to the Serco facility. I've been in a lot of nerve centers in a, a lot of high-speed military environments, and this rivaled anything that I've seen on a military side. It was like uh, you see in the movies or on the TV show where there's the situation room in the White House during some crisis. Um, you, can, you can take the official line and... and work it through the State Department or you can, you know, try these back channels. Um, but I would suggest kind of do it quickly because the, um, <laughs> if Africans can fuck it up, they will, and it will be at the, it will be at the, the cost of you and your guys that are hanging by the thumbs. 
We pulled out every stop, really. Meanwhile, Amadeo was assembling a large legal team on both sides of the Atlantic. And is he coordinating with the U.S. Embassy? Sally, I don't think he's actually coordinating with them, but I have talked to the embassy again. They have, re they have called me. They're sending us a list of attorneys. We then began to get information about what was being done uh, and so that we could begin to counter it because one of our early fears was that they would, after they had been caught detaining these guys, once they knew the guys weren't hurt, that they would come up with some story as to why they had detained them. I understand that they've been moved um, and that, you know, that because of the politics of the situation, uh, you know, it could, could face some charges of espionage. You know. Now let me tell you what I think. We actually believe they were set up. And they are working right now to give me the evidence to prove it. However, the important part about this right now is not right or wrong. This is a purely tactical event. We need to get our three guys out of the prison, into the embassy and across the border. Does they have weapons? Negative. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's strictly prohibited for private security to carry weapons in the Congo, and we didn't... Uh, pursue that and uh, none of our guys had weapons on them. Basically they were down there, you know, doing democracy work. Back in Kinshasa, now four days into their captivity, Robinson and Billings still had no idea why they were being held. There's no one ever looked me in the eye and said, you know, you're being held, charged, detained, for, but we would get, of the, the, the local language speakers and the French speakers in our group, we'd come back from their interrogations that, you know, you're being held for uh, overthrowing the government, you're mercenaries, this is a coup d'etat, and people say you're trying to kill the president. They kept calling me uh, commando. You're a commando, you're a commando. And uh, the, uh, the worst part was uh, in my backpack, in the bottom of my backpack was my retirement credentials from the Secret Service. And they don't know what retired means in the Congo. Um, Secondly, they don't know what the Secret Service does. To them, the Secret Service is 007. And I kept trying to explain to them that, that the Secret Service protects people. We're, we're defensive. We, we protect the president. Amadeo now knew where his executives were being held, but no one had seen or spoken to them. With serious concerns about their health and treatment, they turned up the pressure. She's getting a lot of pressure from um, folks you know, throughout the U.S. government uh, and mentioned that even some members of Congress had, had called to ask the status um, of, of, of the Americans. What we wanted to just find out from your contacts, if it's possible to either, one, if we can get them out and get them somewhere to be picked up and taken to a medical facility, or two, if it's possible to get uh, a, you know, an independent third-party medical person or team into where they're being held. The one thing I have learned here is that everything, and I mean everything, costs money. No one does anything for, for free here, and we will quickly deplete what we have in the tank. We, 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 we have found, we, we, we'll take care of that tomorrow, Bernard. You'll, you'll, have okay. a, you'll have sufficient resources. They received such um, an onslaught of pressure from so many different angles that, in his exact words, arrests happen in the DRC all the time. What was so special about these guys that so much pressure was being put on them to let them go? The pressure was finally beginning to pay off. On Tuesday, day five of their captivity, Robinson and Billings were finally allowed to speak with the U.S. Embassy. Has anyone visited them from the U.S. Embassy? The Department of State just called about uh, an hour ago, and um, they've been in to see Joe and Kevin. Um, that they were in good health, that they didn't seem to have any physical scars or uh, any signs of physical abuse. So it's definitely a relief when you hear from the U.S. government that, yes, we've spoken to your guys. When that happened, uh, we felt a little bit of relief well, that at least the people detaining the fellows over there uh, would know that there is governments and government agencies looking at them. Um, which is good news, um, but they are probably, if they do release this, they might hit us with uh, uh, some sort of charges of espionage or whatever. It didn't take long. With the world now looking in, the Congolese government went on the offensive, 
parading their captives in front of the press and accusing them of plotting to overthrow the government. Apparently, Joe and Kevin were taken to a public press conference. Donc, ils sont toujours à, ils sont toujours à Kim Mazier. Okay, je vous rappellerai dans une demi-heure. Okay, d'accord. Au revoir. They went. They did a press conference with Joe, Kevin, and everybody. I don't know what happened in that press conference, but they were brought to a press conference, then brought back to Kim Mazier. He says about 100% sure they're back in Kim Mazier. Back in Orlando, the ACME team was preparing to launch its own media campaign. So we are going to secure the families before they get public. So make sure that all relevant parties know that we are not to discuss the names. The situation is by no means out of hand, except somebody's trying to play a media game and, and this isn't a game anymore. People's lives are at stake. Again, if there is press, we have a PR firm being retained now in D.C., uh, which includes President Clinton's former press secretary f forwarding down to Orlando. We have uh, uh, Woody Johnson and Mark Middleton here. Do not speak to the press. Do not speak to anybody you do not know. We do not need to have anybody in a public arena. Our people's lives are at stake. And mistaken information getting out into the Internet will cause more damage th than anything else because it will get misinterpreted. The following day, day six, the story hit the international and national press. Boston Globe, uh, San Francisco, um, CNN, BBC, ABC, it's pretty much all over the place. The UN responded to some of these articles um, by basically saying that they're not concerned. It appears to be a case of political manipulation by the Congolese government, and they haven't confirmed anything. But obviously it looks like the UN's on our side. Nonetheless, you do not have any communications with the press, no official statements to anyone. I gave the embassy my word yesterday we would not act until the end of business in Kinshasa today. We lit up enough fires over the weekend that we need to give them a chance to, to use the diplomatic process. While ACME continued building its recovery team, Robinson and Billings were doing some team building of their own. It took the Nigerians a few days to finally admit to us that they had, every time they were being interrogated that if they answered a question that they, oh, we don't, we don't know, uh, they were hitting them. It was at that point that we said no more, no more interrogations for anybody and that way we could control them from, from uh, abusing any, any of the members of our group. I gave the most amount of my time and attention to the dynamics of our group because there were racial, tribal, national issues there. We had Americans, South Africans, white, black, Nigerians, we had Muslims, we had a born-again Christian, we had a guy who claimed to be an atheist. I'm most proud of the fact that we kept the entire group dynamics together the entire time. As their captivity dragged on, Billings and Robinson worked to keep the group's spirits up. It seemed like the guys were kind of getting down and so I started singing If You're Happy and You Know It and uh, the it's a song that uh, I, I have no idea why it came to mind, but I thought how apropos for a situation like this. And it's I mean, the, the fact that there's no way in hell anybody here is happy. But so I started singing that song, and and even the uh, the South Africans and the Nigerians started clapping their hands and then stomping their feet. If you're happy, you know, stomp your feet. It was that feet stomping and hand clapping that got the curiosity of the guards. It's funny to watch these guards peeking around the corner with an AK-47 in their hand. So if a guard came in and stared too long or too intense, Kevin would just walk over and shut the window in their face. And you'd see the lid lift, they get surprised in their eyes, and then they would walk away. I mean, Kevin, quite a character, quite a strong guy. And those type of things to bond us together and to show them that, you know, it wasn't getting to us, I, I think, helped the happy moments. We ended up singing uh, America the Beautiful, uh, Star Spangled Banner. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> but National Pride songs. But we did that because of the fact that we're proud to be Americans. The captives slept on the floor and were given one meal every 24 to 36 hours. Bread, water, and occasionally sardines. The bread was good. The bread was actually good. It was it was fresh baked, just uh, looked like a a hoagie bun almost. And uh, then they were bringing us uh, cans of uh, tuna, uh, tuna, not tuna, but uh, sardines. And they were just horrendous. 
that sardines were just horrible. By their seventh day in captivity, both Billings and Robinson began to realize the end could be months or even years away. And uh, he leaned over to me and says, if you think you're getting out of here, you're wrong. He says, you will be here for three months. I would have been fine with three months. I could work three months. If they were going to charge me and put me in prison for 10 years, then we would have had some type of an incident. Old Joey would have been out that window door, knocking somebody down, running for the Congo River in Brazzaville. I mean, there's no way, I don't believe Kevin or Seth and I either, there's no way we would have acquiesced to staying there for 10 years. With worldwide diplomatic channels now fully engaged and no resolution in sight, ACME launched its media campaign on day eight. Information tonight on two Orlando men held captive in the Congo. We're learning a lot more tonight about the local men accused by the military government of involvement in a coup plot. They have been held since late last week. We told you about Joe Robinson, the former deputy chief of chief of staff for Mayor Buddy Dyer, who was one of three men detained in the Congo. We've just learned the name of the second captive from Central Florida, Kevin Billings. Stick. Billings, a 20-year Secret Service agent, served as the security consultant for the new action film, The Sentinel. Previously, he headed security details for former Presidents Bush, former Clinton, President. and Reagan. I'm your host, Joe Robinson. And I'm your co-host, Local Robinson. viewers may best recognize Joe Robinson as the longtime host of Inside Orlando, the program that airs on Orange TV. Shown here behind Mayor Dyer, he also served as Deputy Chief of Staff and bodyguard for Dyer and former Mayor Hood. And the plot thickens. The presidential candidate who these men were actually planning for, who is a U.S. and Congo citizen, is now being threatened himself. We understand the State Department is involved. And within just a few minutes, I'm told by Senator Bill Nelson's office, he will be talking to the third person in charge at the State Department, try to raise the pressure to get these men home safely. With his security force held captive, Dr. Kashalo remained in a downtown Kinshasa hotel without any protection but he continued to campaign. Dr. Kishala, just walk in the room and talk to him. Yeah, let me do that. Hey, hey, Mike. hey doctor. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing good. We believe you're number four in the polls right now. So they should try to kill this publicity quickly because it's having exactly the reverse effect. Never ever in a, have I seen in this country an American put in jail for so long time for very ridiculous reasons. I've never seen this. Uh, we have every reason to believe progress is being made. So, other than doing your, your normal in Kinshasa campaigning right now, I think it would be imprudent to associate yourselves with this event. You can speak out about free and fair elections. You can speak out about, you know, it, you know every, nobody should be trying to intimidate anyone else because a lot of other people are doing that. But I wouldn't be specific yet. We, we need to allow the United States an opportunity to act as we have promised them. In the, the preceding period of time, we noted that Dr. Kashala may have had one or two significant stories during the, the, the incident itself and in the couple of weeks subsequent, right up to when the World Cup started, he's on the front page all the time. And in a great deal, because he showed his character by standing up to the government at great personal risk to himself during this crisis to defend his people that were detained and in danger. A diplomatic resolution was always the preferred option, but from day one, alternate plans were being developed. Lawyers were brought in to supervise the legal transfer of money overseas in case money was demanded for their release. I had our counsel do uh, a legal opinion have it confirmed by outside counsel. They found a most unique thing, and much to their surprise, they walked in and told me, if we have to pay money to get them out, we need to call it a bribe, because then we can deduct it on our tax return. <laughs> and that's in the code itself, just like that. Robinson and Billings were building the foundation for an escape attempt. There were guards that we were building rapport with, that we were giving money to, and there was buying food for us. So we were actively working, too, on the possibility that we could co-opt a guard uh, so they could get at least a head start. The combined weight of the worldwide diplomatic and media pressure was finally beginning to produce results. We are aware of from direct intelligence that there was ongoing global settlement negotiations late into the evening yesterday. Most people had predicted that it would be uh, four to six months and would certainly not take place not only until the election was over but any subsequent runoff was over. 
why we had to make sure that we attracted enough attention. And, and it, we did. And in the international press, and the international press bled, bled backwards into the local press. When you invest in human capital, which is what we do here at ACME, uh, that the rewards that that reaps are just um, innumerable. And we saw that in that situation room. You had individuals that were just shining. Um, and they were showing uh, that they were worth every penny they were paid and probably worth twice what they were getting paid. Inside their guarded cell, unaware that a diplomatic breakthrough appeared imminent, the captives tried to remain positive. Every day you, get, you woke up, you thought, okay, tonight's the night that we're gonna load up. And for me, everybody had their own little point where they knew it wasn't gonna happen. For me, it was, if, if they feed us, we're not going anywhere. The flight left at 920. So I had hope up until about 7 o'clock at night. After 7, there was no time to get to the airport, so you knew it wasn't going to be that day. And then, on day 9, the Congolese suddenly reversed their position and agreed to release the Americans with no charges. We applied pressure everywhere uh, in hopes that, that a pressure applied everywhere would eventually bear fruit somewhere. And in the end, it did. It was a common event amongst the people that were there, and myself included, that Every once in a while we were smiling when we accomplished things and we didn't want to because the guys weren't safe yet. But we knew we were doing a, 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 a spectacular job. Before leaving, Billings demanded his captors return his Secret Service credentials. I even got to the point where they said, no, no, you're not getting it. And I said, well, then I'm not going. Uh, and Joe, it caused Joe a little concern. And uh, as Joe said, please don't make me beg you. <laughs> And I said, no, you guys go. I said, I can't leave without it because it is a big, it is a big deal. And he fought up till the instant they stuck him on that airplane to get those credentials back. And, uh, and as a, a federal, a special agent in the federal government, I think every federal agent could take a good lesson from Kevin and how he represented the United States, our company and all. It's a good guy. Finally, Robinson, Billings, and Taylor were driven to the airport and paraded in front of the media one final time. And so we got in the seats and closed the little one. I was sitting by Seth, and Kevin was to my right in the center. And, uh, so we closed that window, almost like we could block them all off from looking, because they had about 50 of their police officers out there immediately just standing. So then we're taxiing to the active runway, and still opening the door and peeking out at these guys. Wanting to shoot a bird, you know, but not, you know, think it's still their country, you know, they're, they're, they're still in control. Then he lit that candle, and that big airplane started going forward. Once we got wheels up, I immediately picked up the, uh, uh, phone from the uh, from the armrest there, the, the air phone, and, and called my wife. Uh, I said, who is this? Because I couldn't imagine it would be him calling me, but it sounded like him. He goes, this is your husband. He goes, I'm on a plane, we've just left the Congo. And we had, of course, friends and relatives that were with us, and so I was getting very excited, and every other kick, girls came running downstairs, and we were just tickled to death to know that he was Wheels up, out of there. First phone call was to my wife, unsuccessful. Um, made two or three phone calls. I did not realize to what level Acme Strategy and Frank Amadeo had protected our families. They'd actually cut off cell phones, used different phones, and moved them to a completely different residence. So my calls home didn't work. My calls to cell phones didn't work. Third or fourth time, I called my mom looking for my brother's phone call, and my mom fell apart. I, I just didn't realize how this had rippled out. So my mom heard my voice, she fell apart, and then was finally able to get my, my brother's cell phone number, who I was unsuccessful in getting. And then, but by about the seventh or eighth number that I dialed, I finally connected through to my wife and uh, started the process of you know, learning what was going on there and telling them that we were okay and going to be home soon. Yeah, we had, uh, had uh, beer and uh, eight actual airline food that tasted good <laughs> and uh, then tried to t get some sleep but to be honest with you I don't think any of us slept that well on that that flight. Word of their release spread quickly. Two Central Florida men held captive in Congo should be back in the United States later this week. Acme Strategy Corporation confirmed that Joe Robinson and Kevin Billings from Orlando and Seth Taylor from San Diego were all released Saturday. Three Americans captured in the Congo will go through medical checkups in Europe before heading home to the United States. Less than 48 hours later, they were back home and the first to greet them, company president Frank Amadeo. Hey, Frank. 
How you doing? Oh, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Man, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Good to be oh. Bad as before. things could have gone, which I was, was going to swear it, it was going to happen. I'm amazed at how everything just kind of came out right. Thank All you. right, guys. Thank you. Let's get you out of here so you can go home to the families. All right. Thanks for the support. Yeah, it absolutely. We feel it every day. We definitely yeah, could. Good to be home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that for us. I love you too. I'll see you in a little bit. A quick call home followed by a short ride home. We came back to the house and, and uh, she rushed and made that little sign there um, real quickly for him because we found out that he would be home at, you know, about three o'clock, I guess. And so she put that together and, and he came in the side door. So we went running out there with that. And, and uh, it was just wonderful to see him. The military experts predicted the guys would be dead within six weeks. The diplomats and the FBI predicted it would take at least 90 to 120 days to get them out. Everybody just came together in such a way that um, it was an unstoppable force. It was the fact that we hit them from so many different sides at once. I guess they had simply decided they didn't know what the consequence of holding them any longer would be. Two local men held hostage in the Congo are now safe at home in central Florida. Tonight, a look at the happy homecoming for two Orlando men held captive in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Two central Florida men who were held captive in the Congo were treated by doctors today in Orlando. After a couple of days to rest and reunite with their families, Billings and Robinson met the media. Well, welcome, everybody, to the Acme Strategy Corporation office. We're in uh, pretty much of a celebration mode here. The entire time that Kevin and I were there, we knew that there were people at home who cared, people were working for us, had no doubt that that was happening. Believe it or not, we could really feel the support uh, that was being brought to bear on the government in the Congo every day. Good evening, I'm Wendy Chioji. I'm Jim Payne. They hired themselves out as political consultants and ended up being accused of plotting to overthrow the current Congo government. Today, they talked about their harrowing ordeal in captivity while diplomats work behind the scenes for their release. They are sharing just an incredible story of survival. Two local men who were held captive in the Congo. They were providing security and consulting for a presidential candidate there when the ruling party seized them for two weeks. From bedbugs to AK-47s pointed at their heads, two Orlando men held captive in Africa for more than a week have an incredible story to tell about their ordeal. ACME and Tactical Intelligence International safely orchestrated the release of their employees, but say their work on behalf of the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo is far from finished. We haven't given up in the Congo. In fact, I just have a renewed vigor. I don't talk to my wife about it so much, but I have a renewed vigor about applying economic theories that Frank Amadeo has developed there because they're so ingenious that they're very simple to do, very simple to apply, and would work, I think, almost instantly. I have extended an offer to the country, to all of the candidates, that assuming they can avoid a civil war, I will assist them in redeveloping their economy, in the I will double their gross natural product and remove them from debtor nation status within 12 months. Within three years, they will be a first world country. And that, all they have to do is not kill each other. That service will be extended to whoever wins the election. It was nine days that may help shape a country, nine days that definitely defined a company. Yeah, Frank has such a big heart and that was seen throughout this whole process. He was extremely concerned with their well-being. Um, anything that we asked for that we needed as a resource to get the guys out, it was 100% approved immediately. That is something I'll, I'll always remember and I'll always be a loyal employee for Mr. Amadeo. You know, loyalty stems from um, trusting and, and having faith in the individual which, which is leading you. And everyone in that room had uh, complete and utter faith in and the leadership of Mr. Amadeo. I work for the greatest company on earth and for a man named Frank Amadeo who I believe history will record as one of the premier minds of our lifetime. This company is an honorable company that has a tremendous amount of passionate entrepreneurial people working for it who have a view to the future. I believe Acme Strategies and all the other subsidiary companies and entities uh, is a conglomerate of companies that have a business plan without borders.